started talking about supernova sequence. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, so yeah, I'm a uh, CETA National Fellow out at uh, McMaster. And so basically I'm going to tell you what I did in my uh, thesis work at the University of Washington with, um, as you can see, Tom Quinn, who was a former CETA postdoc. Um, and so I have to start with uh, what is supernova feedback, and it's just, um, of course, the effect that stars have on the gas that they formed out of. So they put energy back into that gas, they put metals into that gas, and they hopefully stop the gas from sort of continuously forming stars or, you know, overcooling. Um, and the thing about it, so when, you know, when I started the project, everybody was like, oh, it's supernova feedback, you know, supernova feedback. But I mean, the more you, I don't know, the more I've sort of learned about it and stuff, I mean, it's really just stellar feedback, right? I mean, it's like not necessarily the supernova explosion that's doing the feeding back, but a lot of the, you know, H1 bubbles you get are from stellar winds or, um, you know, UV radiation. And it turns out the way we implemented the supernova feedback is more like stellar feedback rather than supernova feedback. So where this talk is going is um, towards dwarf galaxies, which are, uh, you know, funny looking little objects. And uh, they're, I mean, obviously the smallest objects are the one where supernova feedback, which is at a fixed energy, is going to have the biggest effect. Um, so, um, you know, when you start talking about dwarf galaxies, of course, you, uh, you know, you might, I'm not really going to hit on it, but, you know, potentially the, the substructure problem and why aren't there as many satellites to, in something like the local group as there are for um, a cluster of galaxies, right? So, uh, you know, why are the observations uh, down here for the local group where the simulations were here and the cluster hits the, sim hits the dark matter only simulation? And then the other major sort of issue at the moment is um, downsizing where, you know, you have small galaxies that are still blue and forming stars, whereas the big galaxies that started with a lot more stars ran out of their gas a long time ago. Um, so for solving these problems, I use smooth particle hydrodynamics, which is just taking the universe, splitting it up into particles, letting those particles move around. Uh, and so what we want to do in smooth particle hydrodynamics is hopefully get a uh, uh, convergent star formation recipe um, that's physically motivated um, using constraints from local galaxies. And so in this particular talk, what I'm going to tell you about is taking these recipes and putting them just into simple models. Um, and then I'm sure you've seen, you know, the work by Faber Governado and Allison Brooks where they've taken the same recipe and they've put it into fully cosmological models. Um, but for this, this talk, for my thesis, I dealt with just simple models. So you take away all the complications of hierarchical merging, and what do you get out when you just have a ball of a gas collapse? So before I get into the models, I have to tell you how we actually make this thing work. Um, and so basically the scheme is you want to take million solar mass gas particles and form a couple star particles out of them. So just keep in mind that we're talking about big things. We're not talking about individual stars. We're talking about molecular clouds. Um, that's just the resolutions that we're at today um, with, with, with the best computers. And so basically the scheme is we have star formation criteria. That cuts off um, a, a subset of gas that's going to be available for forming stars. And then that subset of gas, um, we just apply a Schmidt law um, to say which stars will actually, say which gas particles will actually form a star on a given time step. And then, of course, those stars, uh, those star particles are like a stellar population, and some of them are massive, and so you get supernova feedback out of it. I think that's what's coming here. Yeah. Um, right. So, so, yeah. So it's a density threshold, and, and we've been using a 0.1 particle per cubic centimeter. And... Um, and then we've been saying, well, it's got to be cool as well. So our cooling curve cuts off at 10,000 Kelvin. So we have a, 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 a temperature threshold of 15,000 Kelvin. Um, 
So it's very simple criteria. These are the these are the gas particles that can form stars in the blue region. And so then the Schmidt law, <coughs> Rob Kennicott went and observed a whole bunch of galaxies and saw that there was a, a, a pretty steady relationship between you know, sort of grossly averaged uh, surface density of gas versus um, star formation rate, and that the, the slope was 1.4 or 5, which makes sense because um, you know, over these large areas, you've got the density of the gas as one parameter, and then you've got the time scale for them to collapse. And the time scale for collapse, of course, has a 1 over square root of rho in it, so you get the rho to the 1.5. Um, and so for the scales that we're doing these simulations on, that's reasonable. Once we get to a point where we're sort of resolving the genes length of molecular clouds, we'll have to change the recipe, but we're not there yet. So this is what we do with the resolutions we have today. And I should also mention that so the way you tune this model, right, so I said we're going to constrain it, how many stars should form is this C star, just a constant star formation parameter. And so then that gets into sort of the, I mean, that's kind of all the stuff that, you know, has been in place since uh, at least Neil Katz did his SPH simulations in 92. Um, so then... But when Neil did his runs, uh, he, you know, he, he, he tried to take a stellar population and say, this many of the stars are going to blow up a supernova, you're going to put this much energy in the surrounding gas. But what would happen is that they were in a really dense region, so the gas would cool, you know, almost instantly, and you get no feedback effect, and you got this, you had to deal with this pretty severe overcooling. So, um, the way that we chose to deal with this, which is similar to what other people have done, um, is in the region immediately surrounding the star that is feeding back, we turn off the cooling, which is, um, you know, potentially a dicey thing to do. So we want to do it as uh, sort of physically motivated a way as possible. And so... Other groups have sort of introduced parameters which essentially are how many particles are we going to turn the cooling off and how long are we going to turn it off for instead of using parameters that you could tweak or whatever. We finally ended up just, you know, when I was doing as a PhD student, you read McKee and Ostreicher 77 and you're like, oh, wow, look at that. There's these equations that are dependent on, you know, the energy of the explosion, the surrounding densities and pressures that give you a radius that the blast wave should go to in typical ISM sort of conditions and a time that it should last for. And it turns out to be not that much different than these prescriptions, but, you know, I mean, if you have varying environments, at least now you have some, you're not, you know, tuning parameters like you have an equation, a, a relationship that's, that's, uh, that's steady, and so we don't have to tune anything anymore. Um, and so the first thing I did was... Uh, I just looked at a Milky Way galaxy, just just as kind of just the Milky Way disk. Yeah. With, with last way, just a little bit more of the real physics going on. So, that, so you're turning off cooling, but physically, what's really going on is this last way propagates out to this radius, and uh, it, when it ionizes the gas or something, or it, and it, it, it injects momentum instead of energy or something, and that's. I'm just trying to. Yeah, I mean, basically the, the idea is, and I guess it's not entirely clear to me which is more important, whether it's um, the stellar winds that are going off that sort of push it or the actual supernovae that explode and by the sort of accumulation of supernovae, you, you know, you get these shock waves going out and just because of the way the um, ISM is, it, it takes a while to cool back down, you know. So we're talking like 10 million years. So this is longer than sort of, um, you know, the set of Taylor So solution. physically the idea, is, is it really that somehow cooling is actually turned off physically somehow, or that somehow the momentum injection is kind of mimicked by artificially turning off cooling? Um, let's see. It's a good question. Uh, you got that. Let's see. So what are we doing? 
Right. Well, how do we turn off the cooling? Um, I mean the. I mean the major reason is that you know, when you look at stuff, it doesn't cool immediately. So. So it is physical. So they actually the, they actually do have these items that cooling is somehow really turned off, even though that's obviously for using subgrid physics. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It's the subgrid. You know. You, we can't. We obviously can't resolve the shock wave going out. So this is our best but the attempt. Real is that somehow nature finds a way to turn it off. Um, well, right. I mean, it's not turning off cooling, but it's all these complicated so things that. What they look at is they see a star formation observationally, and then in their simulations they just try to match that. Which is yeah. I'll and show so they're just adjusting things to like match the observations. So they're matching the observations, even though the, the physics generally is different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's you're absolutely right. No. And it's and it's like I mean it's the major point. But here's exactly what Norm was saying that. Uh, well, it turns out in the in the Milky Way you don't get like a huge effect from the from turning off the cooling from these uh, from the supernova feedback. Um, you know, I mean, you can see it's only like a factor of two. You do have a significant higher, so, I mean, the gas goes away, uh, no, it doesn't, well, I mean, it goes away at the same rate, they both have the same um, time scale, but, uh, but you started out with more, so you end up with less, because there's less gas. Um, but the major, the major, so the major thing that we got out of the Milky Way simulation was figuring out what that C star parameter, the star formation constant, should be. And so it's just a matter, and so the, the major thing that changes when you look at that is just how many stars form at a given gas density. And so, uh, you know, the, the value for C star that, that hit the, the Kennecott Schmidt law was uh, 0.05, which is reasonably nice because uh, it seems like observations suggest that about 5% of the gas that's in molecular clouds turns into scars in a dynamical time. And so the effect that the supernova feedback does have on, um, on a Milky Way galaxy is it keeps it, it gives it pressure support, right? So, so it's, it, I think you can see pretty well here. There's sort of light, they're, they're yellow particles in here, and you can see that there's, there's single yellow particles, and this is colored by temperature, so the yellow ones are hot. And they, they, they have these, these uh, they hold up these bubbles, right? So this is sort of the, you know, making the making the shock wave, and probably the. What's this? No, no. Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, you look at something like the LMC, and you also see, you know, big uh, H1 bubbles. So um, maybe it's a more, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we're doing a reasonable job capturing just the sense of the physics that, you know, you have a, you have a star formation event, and, um, and it, and it helps to pressurize the ISM and, and doing it without changing the equation of state. So that was the um, sort of recipe and how we started to constrain it. So then now that we have this recipe, we're like, okay, well, what kind of galaxies can we form? So um, we took just really simple models, just spherically symmetric, uh, here's the gas, here's the dark matter with their velocities as uh, vectors from each particle. Um, nice equilibrium, dark matter distribution. Uh, put the gas in there at the hydrostatic equilibrium to start with. So we gave it um, a temperature based on the fact that uh, we put the gas in with an NFW profile just like we put the dark matter in with. And then, so of course, after the hydrostatic equilibrium, it's hot, it cools down. Um, and since it's spinning, you get a, a, a disk to form. 
And so we just tried to go, you know, with like uh, initial conditions motivated by the cosmology. I guess the one that you might wonder about is 10% uh, gas, where the cosmic fraction is more like 16%. Um, I mean, to some extent, 10% was a nice round number. To another extent, uh, it's not clear how much gas, you know, does a full cosmic fraction of gas get into every dark matter halo, right? So um, this is this is this is close. Let me just Um, R200, right. So, I mean, just as a way to sort of scale it from the big galaxies, right. So, for a Milky Way sized thing, you're absolutely right. Softening of about 100. And what we actually ended up finding is a different work, it'll be coming, um, is that you get like a bar at 100 parsecs, and then at 50 parsecs, you don't. So I'm just saying no, R200, the virial. So um, it was 100,000 100, just to, you know, as a, as a reasonable. So I was running these for 13 gig years. And so 100,000 was sort of a reasonable test case so I could test a wide range of masses, wide range of different initial conditions. And then, um, and then subsequent studies, I don't know if you saw, there's a paper by Rock Roscar where he looks at the formation of a disk, and uh, he actually uses a million for a Milky Way size thing, and he's the one who um, went to the smaller softenings. Um, and he also did one where he tried to pump it up to 10 million gas, par 10 million particles, and, and that's also um, sort of got interesting results, but it's still confusing, so it's not published yet. And so, as you might expect, for, you know, from a 10 to the 9 dark matter mass halo up to a 10 to the 13 solar mass dark matter halo, without supernova feedback, the star formation looks about the same, right? The, the uh, star formation rate versus time. You get a peak after a couple hundred mega years, and then you get an exponential decay away as the uh, differential equation, you know, exponential solution happens. And so that's no surprise at all because, um, you know, the free fall time for all these is the same. And so it's a couple hundred mega years. Most of the gas has fallen in. Um, the one thing you couldn't see in those plots is how many stars end up getting made relative to one another. And so what you see is a peak um, at a particular mass, in this case 10 to the 10 solar masses, and then uh, less stars being made at higher masses, less stars being made at lower masses. And that's, and this is again without feedback, and it's got everything to do with the cooling time scales, right? So you just have, I didn't, I didn't do anything really complicated in these, but I think the, I think the, the broad brush stroke physics kind of explains it. Just you've got more heat in the thing, it takes longer for it to cool down to a place where it, You've got more heat in the um, initial conditions of the 10 to the 13 halo. It takes longer for it to cool down. This is, you know, stuff that was said in a lot of papers in the 70s. Um, okay. And so then you see there's some of, some bumpiness in the higher mass halos. And so here's one of the simulations by Rock that's got a million particles in it. And this is a Milky Way sized run without feedback. And what you see is nothing that looks like a normal galaxy to you, right? I mean, it's got all these instabilities. Um, what's this? But I mean, it's the spherical collapse, right? And it's so, I mean, so, so then with the feedback, you get a nice smooth disk that ends up collapsing out of that. So. I'm just trying to make the point that without the feedback. 
Yeah. Right. It is a, it's a disk, but it's a very unstable disk, right. as you can see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, and it's because your, you know, your, your sound speed is so low, right? So we added in the feedback, right? Makes sense. And um, so that's the red lines. And so what you can see is that the biggest effect of the feedback happens at the smallest masses, which kind of, you know, that's what you'd expect because you have a constant amount of energy you're putting in from star formation events, and the lowest masses are the, have the smallest uh, potential wells, so um, the gas can get pushed around the most. And then at higher masses, stuff stays about the same. And so here you see that effect. Um, so with feedback, uh, star formation at lower masses gets um, reduced significantly. And when you say star formation, <coughs> you mean like 13 meters, what fraction of the gas do you think is already present? I can't remember if this is after 5 giga years or 13. But yeah, yeah, but that's exactly what I mean, is just, yeah. And so. When I first looked at that, I was like, oh, well, there's the work by Frank van der Bosch where he looks at the um, mass to light ratio of galaxies at, at uh, various different masses. And, you know, he compares dark matter uh, simulations with um, surveys. And uh, so he sees that there's like this peak star formation where the mass to light ratio is the lowest. And, you know, and then that, that uh, peak efficiency drops off as you go to different masses. So I was like, oh, well, that looks very similar to my day. And why don't we plot it against it? And um, on a log scale, you can see that I'm still quite a ways off. And the basic reason for that is that these simulations are just too simple, right? I mean, at this point, I mean, it was just an isolated collapsing halo. There's no uh, UV background to possibly keep gas out of the um, potential. There's no AGN. There's no merging stuff, so, uh, sorry. Yeah. So it's the efficiency plot turned upside down, essentially. And so, I mean, it makes sense, right, because the cooling curve you know, the virial temperature of a 10 to the 11th galaxy is right where the cooling curve is the most powerful. So how do you end up with your more massive ones to be less efficient? Like, you know, the low, at low end, yeah, your feedback turns off, makes, turns off your star formation. But yeah, normally, doesn't it get more and more efficient as you go back to the massive ones? Like, what changes in your simulation at 10 to the 12th solar masses? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that's certainly one effect. And you can, see, yeah, does that make sense? That was, that was, I kind of breezed through that slide when I had the, the free fall time scale compared to the cooling time. And it was just the simple, I mean, I was just doing hand wavy argument that if you have more energy in the big galaxy, it's going to take longer for it to cool down. Does that make sense? Um, that, that black curve. At the high mass end, for sure, yeah, yeah, right. And at the low mass end, you can see there's more effective feedback. So at the high mass end, I mean, there's an offset. Relative suppression is still monotonic. Like relative, if you start less of a black, you still become less relative. You still have a monotonic function in the suppression. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, cooling function cuts off at 10,000. The fact that this goes up and it doesn't keep going straight down monotonically like you're saying. Observationally, do you see things? I mean, the local group where satellites have mass light ratios of 100 or 200. You're talking about even our sector. He's talking about a set of criteria. Okay. So, I mean, so you're, I'm just trying to understand that. 
Hmm? Or, or that party show is about a barn. I mean, if you go, if you go, you know, we've probably got thousands of people in the hardware. And normally, Well, I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, in, essentially the point that I'm going to get to is that in dwarf galaxies, you're only going to see where the stars are. And in dwarf galaxies, the densities are so much lower that you can only form stars in the very central part of that. So you're only going to be able to trace out a certain distance, even with H1, you know. I mean, you don't get above the sort of H1. Uh, so observationally, it's just really hard to, people believe that there are, you know, large dark matter here like that, much, much larger distances. Yeah, right. I mean, you got to do you got to do gravitational lensing things to to see that effect. Yeah. And if, and I don't know. I mean, I'm not too familiar. I'm afraid with the uh, weak lensing so what, effect so is, of dwarf galaxies, but I imagine it's hard to do. The, um, or, or the things that you have no idea what the dwarf. You have no idea what. Maybe we can talk about this a little more afterwards. Um, so the thing that, that, of course, was interesting from those star formation rate plots was that in this low mass case, you get this red line at the bottom where the star formation rate is suppressed so much, but it, it, it goes up and down. There's, there's bursts of star formation, and then the star formation stops. And so why is that? Well, here's the movie of it. Um, you get a star formation event right at the beginning, uh, which this feedback from which drives gas out, and then um, the gas takes a while to collapse back in. You get more stars to form, and then it drives gas out again. And so you get what I'm calling a breathing sort of uh, star formation rate. So which there's no. I mean, right, the only infall is this smooth accretion. Yeah. And inside so the the inside the, the, sphere, the sphere, yeah. So, I mean, the other thing that we're going to look at is what if you just set up filaments and you have filaments feed the gas in? Is it any different? And I don't think it is. But, um, yeah. And so through the different low masses, so only going up to 10 to the 10 dark matter mass from 10 to the 9, you see that um, all of these halos have this sort of effect where the, the feedback, you know, is able to push the gas around um, pretty significantly. And so at the lower masses, uh, you get sort of spherical looking halos. Um, but then as you go to higher mass, you get more continual star formation and it gets to be a diskier. Some of it escapes. Oh, but you know. I mean, because in reality, actually, that, that shouldn't occur, right? Because the, the shock wave perhaps, you know, it pushes gas out and, you know, it, and don't actually, you know, it can mess it and actually get, get out the halo. I mean, but it, I mean, it can, you know, open up a chimney and hot gas can escape through that chimney. And I mean, I think, you know, I mean, this is like, you know, Maclow and Ferrara did these sorts of things and they had gas escaping and so so that's definitely something that I'll I'll publish is what the escape fraction is for um, so how the outflows look like and just let me point out that I'm gonna flip back and forth in terminology between 10 to the 9 solar masses and call that 15 kilometer per second which means that the virial radius the velocity is uh, 15 kilometers per second and then so the mass so going to higher mass we get up to 30 kilometers per second halos. 
And so here's the star formation rate, hi or star formation histories for those galaxies. You can see there's this oscillating thing. You can see it oscillates on about, and again, a couple hundred mega year time scale. So this makes you think, oh, well, this has everything to do with the free fall time, um, which is kind of nice. So, okay, so I've, I've, I've demonstrated this thing. Is there any observational relate, you know, is this related to observations anyway? So the one galaxy that has been uh, studied a little bit is, uh, this is the Phoenix Dwarf Galaxy. And it ends up being uh, rather similar at the end to our simulated smallest galaxy, the 10 to the 9 solar mass, 15 kilometer per second halo. It's got about the same uh, absolute magnitude, about the same mass in stars. Uh, and so the observed, so they're getting pretty good at, at taking um, photometry of these things and uh, figuring out sort of a rough uh, star formation history. It's hard to separate, uh, you know, like eight gig year old stars from 11 gig year old stars. So it's hard to believe exactly what happens at the um, long ago end of the scale. But the basic, I mean, as you'd expect, we have the same number of stars as are observed. So the relative scale of uh, star formation rate, you know, is this five times 10 to the minus four. So that's kind of what you'd expect. But what's more interesting is they have better resolution at late time. So it's a lot easier to tell apart a 300 mega year star, old star from a 600 mega year old star. And there's still pretty big error bars on this, but there seems to be in the data um, these these periodic outbursts of star formation, and then they seem to be separated by the same couple hundred mega year time scale. So it indicates that a couple hundred mega years, the free fall time, is a reasonable time scale to think about um, star formation uh, possibly uh, ep having episodes. So that's kind of neat. You get um, these dwarf galaxies to breathe because of the supernova feedback. But then where do the stars end up? So you form them, what happens, where are the stars? Um, and so here's the same small galaxy but it run with a million particles instead of uh, 100,000 so you can see a lot more stars. And I've also made the stars brighter so that you can see um, where they end up before you're only seeing new stars form and then they faded away. And so you can kind of see, um, so you get this, you know, pretty major ball of stars at the middle where all the stars are forming. There's some amount of shock waves propagating out, and in those shock waves, stars form, and so you get this sort of diffuse halo of stars um, at pretty large radii all the way out to, say, 8 kiloparsecs. And again, this is, this is only happening. I'm not suggesting this is a formation of like a Milky Way halo at all. The Milky Way halo's potential is way too deep for stars to go this far. I mean, we go up just a little bit in mass, factor of 10 in mass, and the stars escape nowhere near this far. You know, it's much more like five kiloparsecs. But in the small galaxy, you get this happening. And so if you just look at what is the, um, what's the surface brightness profile of these things, um, and so we did it on a log linear scale to uh, point out that it seems to follow a pretty good exponential fall off. But not only is it an exponential fall off, um, it's got, it seems to have different segments. So there's like a, a shorter scale length part and a longer scale length part, a little shallower, and then back to a steeper into a shallower. And you're like, well, whatever, you're just looking at density profiles, that doesn't really matter. But it's interesting that um, when they looked at Leo A, they also saw this similar sort of behavior where you had a, a shallower slope, a steeper slope, and a shallower slope. And the other thing about it is that when they looked at the photometry of this stuff, the inner stuff had, the inner um, part of the profile had many more young blue stars. So this is where stars were continuing to form. Um, and then as you went out, you got uh, older and older stars. And they were like, oh, well, this looks exactly like the Milky Way halo. And so it must have formed um, 
via some sort of like hierarchical merging process, um, you know, just like the Milky Way halo did. But what we're seeing is that you can get, I mean, structure sets up without um, hierarchical merging. These are very simple simulations. And so our, I mean, our major issue would be that if you have a galaxy that's this, that's this size, the substructure is not necessarily going to have been big enough to form stars. So it seems a little bit more reasonable to us that, um, that this, uh, that this would have happened just because of, an, because of uh, some mechanism, and I'll get to that, and it's not feedback. And so that's one example of a galaxy. And then, so my co-author on this paper is Julianne Del Canton, and so she did a pretty extensive review of the literature of um, people who looked at the halos of dwarf galaxies, and it turns out that these halos are basically ubiquitous. So all this plot is is like every point on here has a younger inner region of stars and a older outer region of stars. So, you know, it's got a blue central part surrounded by red giants. And um, so the basic point of this plot is that you have all the way from bright stuff, sort of as bright as the SMC, um, uh, down to a lot less bright stuff, and from stuff that's right next to tidally interacting with galaxies to stuff that's just isolated way out in the middle of nowhere you get these halos. So it looks like you want some amount of uh, halo forming from isolated galaxies. And so that's what we see. And so here's another example. So I was talking about the Phoenix Dwarf Galaxy before, and they've got all these isochrones on there, but um, what, you can, what you might be able to see behind them is that when they look in the center, there's a lot of bright blue stars that make up the main sequence, and then as they look further out, um, there's not that. And, uh, you know, based on other aspects of the color magnitude diagram, the population looks much older. And so we did, right, so the observers go from this to a star formation history. We went from a star formation history to a color magnitude diagram just to make the comparison. And um, that way, and we tend to see the same trend. You know, again, you have a, a pretty established main sequence uh, at small radii, and then as you go further out, you have less of that. Um, I think this plot shows it much more clearly, which is just, so looking at the different models, so um, dash dot is the smallest galaxy, uh, solid is the, um, is the highest mass galaxy in the sample which only goes up to 10 to the 10 solar masses. So you see this, that the mean stellar age as you go out gets older in these small galaxies. And so why, so what I'm going to get to is why is this? But I should also point out that, that this seems to be sort of a generic thing for um, all the halos in this mass range. And then once you start to get to this higher mass where you get these disks forming, then you start to see this decline in the age of stars as you go out, right? So that's the signature of a disk forming. And so that's what this um, Rock Roscar paper was about. And so here's sort of in detail um, just the previous plot. And so this lets you see, first of all, so this is where stars are versus when they form. So you can see in the smallest mass one, you have these bursts of star formation. It looks like stripes on here in time. Um, and, then, and then you can see how it's, it looks like there's an envelope, kind of, of star formation. And this is on a log plot, so the slope isn't that noticeable. I'll show it later on a linear plot. Um, and so basically the point is that at the beginning, stars were forming further out because there was more gas. And then um, probably by gas exhaustion, the um, radius for star formation decreases. And so basically you, um, basically I'm not saying, so, 
So the supernova feedback um, sort of forms the stars that go way out to these high radii, but it's just it's just the nature of the star formation, the fact that these star these uh, galaxies are just above the star formation threshold, that by the end there's just not enough gas to to support star formation way out. But it's also interesting to see uh, that there's there's kind of declines in even these mass galaxies too, where you get um, individual outbursts of star formation, uh, but then those are truncated, and so you have this envelope that, that sort of shrinks with time. And so that's compared to much bigger galaxy like the Milky Way, where you have, um, so rock, uh, was in particular concerned with the um, with the break radius. So in the exponential profile, he found that there was a there was a break essentially where gas got above the density threshold. And so of course in a disk, when you have gas falling onto the disk, um, in a similar model, uh, that grows with time. So with time, the star formation moves outwards. And so uh, and as does the the break radius for the um, for the galaxy. Uh, and so what we see in these smaller galaxies, in particular I think it's interesting to look at the biggest of the small galaxies, is that you, you have this trend and, and it kind of goes, but I mean you have this envelope inside where it, it looks like it's trying to form a disk and then it just kind of runs out of steam and so the, the sort of solid contour runs out and so then at late times you're only forming stars in the very center. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting that that it almost seems natural that it's going to set up the situation where you have a central star formation region at the end that's surrounded by a halo of stuff that formed a long time ago. And so this basically, so this is just the movement, the difference between um, where the stars are versus where the stars formed. And the point is that um, there's not a huge amount of movement, uh, you know, just about in even the smallest halo. Just about as many stars move inwards from where they formed as move outwards, with the exception of stars that have um, gone to large radii. There's stars that have moved outwards that right that started that started pretty close in, and then they were ejected out. Whereas there's not. There's clearly not stars that formed way outside and moved in. Okay, uh, I guess I didn't go through that enough. Um, so basically, what I'm suggesting is that so you get a star formation event at the center of the galaxy, and that sort of starts to drive a shock wave going out. And so in that shock wave, you can potentially, because you increase the density, you can potentially get stars forming. And then since the stars, the way we do it the stars form with the velocity of the gas, and so then those stars can keep on going. Yeah, right, so i and so that's this plot, right? So stars that are the furthest out um, tend to have the largest outward radial velocity. And then what's interesting a little bit is, so when you don't have feedback, you don't get the same effect, of course, because you have nothing to drive it out. Um, and then, but when you do have feedback, but you have, this is in a 35 kilometer per second halo, so a deeper potential well, but um, lower baryon fraction to start with. So it forms about the same amount of stars as this one, but it does not drive. It does, it's not, the, the potential's too deep for supernova feedback to drive stars out of. And so anyway, through this mechanism, it seems reasonable that you can form a halo that has this sort of density profile. And so that's what I wanted to say about my thesis, and it looks like I have maybe f five minutes to talk a little bit more about stuff. So let me, um, so I want to, I mean, basically I want to say that um, it's, uh, okay, clearly I didn't practice transmission enough, 
But um, OK, so just to finish up my thesis, got a star formation recipe, uh, largest effect on smallest galaxies. You get breathing episodes of star formation. Uh, and then we get a halo structure that forms in dwarf galaxies. Um, but, you know, giving a talk at CETA, and you guys are funding my research now, I mean, I really have to say thank you because um, it's really great to be at McMaster because uh, Hugh's there, and then James Wadsley's there, and we've got grad students who are working on these things and adding stuff to uh, the simulations that I'm really looking forward to. So I just wanted to mention a couple things about their work. Um, so Xi Jing Shen has been working on our low temperature cooling. Um, Patrick Rogers is working on radiative transfer. Um, and then Jill's still at University of Washington, and she's going to put AGN into the simulations. Um, but basically, sieging. So, so our, so one of the major problems. I mean, I'm not going. I'm going to admit right off that one of the major problems of the work that I did is that the cooling curve cuts off. You know, this is gasoline's cooling curve, and it cuts off at ten to the ten thousand Kelvin, right? And if you want to look at small systems, this is silly. Like you have to. I mean, you're not. Some of these galaxies weren't really cooling at all. So see, what Seijin has been doing is she's basically taken cloudy, you know, the standard radiative transfer code, and um, put a whole bunch of different uh, sort of um, parameters in, in terms of metallicities and densities and obviously temperatures, and made new cooling curves. And so the plan is basically to make a whole table of cooling curves and then just have lookup tables in gasoline to figure out what the cooling rate should be. And so you can see just the initial part of her research, there's slightly different um, rate constants in cooling in cloudy versus what we're doing in gasoline. And then, of course, the exciting part of her work is to go down to low temperatures. So you see no longer are we going to stop at 10 to the 4, but we're going to stop at 100. And the reason, and I just have this, this plot in here just to show that the reason that we haven't, it's not in there right now, is that we're still wondering about, um, we, want, you know, we want this to be universal. And a lot of times when people take results from Cloudy, they just take the normal Milky Way sort of stuff. And they don't, um, the, you know, I mean, they might be doing sort of beginning of the universe calculations, but they take the conditions that are uh, in the Milky Way, which seems a little silly in some sense. So there's this sort of issue where, you know, when you have the first stars forming, after they form and they start to reionize stuff, that second generation of stars, it's hard to, like, form the molecules to do the cooling. So anyway, we've been hung up on that, but um, hopefully we won't be for too much longer. And then. The other thing that's going to help with that is um, making it making gasoline more able to take the energy that's that's um, produced by whatever um, supernova feedback, star formation, AGN, and distribute it um, more reasonably. And so you need radio transfer to do that. And so the method that we're using to do that, that Patrick Rogers has been working on, is flux limited diffusion. And so all these series of plots show is that you don't have to say that the equation of state is, um, you know, in this case, here's an adiabatic shock where he has a high optical depth. Um, and so then you can hit the middle case where you have, is not adiabatic, it's not, not isothermal, um, but you have rate of transfer going on. And then finally, I just wanted to say, so what I'm doing when I'm here is I guess I'm going to try to take um, one of uh, John Dubinsky's uh, disk models, put gas into it, and just see how the sort of molecular clouds evolve. So basically, the idea would be to take, because I'm not sure that a lot of these simulations are done with self-gravity. So um, you know, it's sort of high enough resolutions with the gas. And so I just want to see how, you know, it seems like 
at this day and age, we can get down to like 100 or 1,000 solar mass gas particles, and with that, you can possibly follow how um, molecular clouds form and evolve. So, yeah, so I'll leave you with one of these um, galaxy formation simulations by Fabio, Allison Brooks, and Chris Brook um, that kind of show a disk forming using supernova feedback recipe. Anyway, thank you so much. Um, I, I don't know. Okay. I probably said that I probably haven't looked at the, uh, the literature enough, but my sense is that when I looked at sort of a paper, you know, you have these grid simulations of the ISM or whatever, and sometimes they have self-gravity and sometimes they don't. And the one paper that I looked at that was like, um, you know, this high resolution disk uh, didn't have, like, I mean, they didn't take into account the fact that gas pulls on its neighbors, and I don't know. So you're trying to, you're trying to put the data into the environment, like you're trying to get the, the, the mass spectrum of molecular clouds, and you compare this to what other people are. Yeah, sure. I mean, right, there's all the. There's all the, the, the Bimasong survey stuff, right? They've done molecular observations. For you're, you're doing it with an n-body photo, right? Yeah. I mean, self-gravity in your particles. Yeah, it's not, right. You, you always do it, right? I mean, that's yeah. the, so, so it's easy, is the you point. You naturally do it, but other people have not done it, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a lot harder in a grid curve. So, yeah. But it seems like the next step for um, supernova feedback recipes and star formation is that it'd be nice as well from our end of things to be able to start to resolve um, the genes, a gene sort of radius that's, uh, well, resolve a genes radius that's more like submolecular cloud scale and just see what with stellar feedback and uh, and star formation what happens.